Thank you. Uh, why I wrote the book? Um, the way that uh, all projects start, I make a prayer. You know, I, I make a prayer to the ancestors and I ask them what they want me to do. <laughs> and uh, and uh, sometimes what they ask me to do is rather daunting, but uh, um, if the request is clear, that's what I have to do. So uh, that's really how original politics came about. I had already written the book Original Thinking, which was more of philosophy of it's really the philosophies that uh, I had been absorbing my entire life and particularly inspired by, as you mentioned in the bio, the, the Language of Spirit dialogue series that brought together Native elders and Western scientists. And then, you know, so that book was a statement of the philosophy. Now it's more like I think the calling was to put this philosophy into action in the real world. So I took Amtrak and it's a, it's a, it's a very slow and leisurely way to go. And uh, uh, I was going by myself, so they would uh, arrange for you to have a meal. You would have to make a reservation for your meal, but they would assign you other diners. Sometimes I would be with uh, a family of three or something, but on this one occasion, I got assigned to three people who are all traveling separately. Um, and one was a, um, a, a strong Trump supporter who was from Lawrence, Kansas. And the other one was um, a gay African-American poet from Albuquerque. Um, and then there was a Native American. And uh, they couldn't be more different in their political views, but I saw that as a great opportunity. And I asked them, you know, what is the sacred? I asked them a dialogue question, which is something I'm familiar with doing. And I asked them, what is the sacred purpose of America? And why do you think your candidate will fulfill that? And the most interesting thing happened because we all had to eat. So, you know, we had a very civil, interesting conversation and the uh the gay african-american poet who was a bernie sanders supporter actually considered bernie sanders too far to the right i mean he couldn't have been you know but he started to get along with the trump supporter so well that it almost freaked me out because they were really getting along very well um and uh uh and then at that point uh i came in and and tried to elucidate some differences perhaps and it was just very engaging. It was also heartening because the the thing is people can have very differing points of view, but if you can if you can listen to each other for the purpose of understanding, which is really the principle of dialogue, rather than just reading your reply as an argumentation or debate, then there's always an opportunity for growth, for learning. The book really was a a search for the sacred purpose of America and how can we achieve that? The 1620 Plymouth colony that stayed bringing women and children with them that obviously got the attention of the Indians. And this was uh, uh, something they watched very carefully and they actually watched from afar. Uh, uh, they didn't interact uh, uh, right away. The, uh, the Plymouth colony lost a third of their colony or more that first winter. They were starving. They were really struggling. Um, and um, uh, then uh, this one native brave who was known as a Samoset, uh, he strode into the, into the, into the village uh, with one arrow that was headed and one that was unheaded. And he walked very confidently into the village and he was walking right up to the encampment of where the women and children were. And then a bunch of soldiers stopped, stopped him in his path. And they thought that he was being aggressive, but he turned to them and he said, welcome Englishmen. <laughs> welcome Englishmen. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and uh, those are really famous words, and and uh, uh, and he had learned a little bit of English. He had actually learned it from his friend, who was known as uh, 
to Squantum and known to the uh, to the uh, the settlers as Squanto, which we've all learned about in history, who knew even more English because he had been kidnapped and had spent almost somewhere between seven and a dozen years in Europe um, before he managed to f free himself and get back all the way across the pond. And he was there and he knew English perfectly. Um, but the one that they sent as the ambassador was Samoset. Uh, and uh, uh, that's just the beginning of a partnership that was formed in a 55 years of peace uh, between uh, the Narragansett uh, and uh, the uh, colonial settlers. Um, it doesn't mean that it was peace in all the land, by the way. They actually had an alliance, they had a military alliance, and they, they, they fought the Pequot in 1636 and almost vanquished them. For 150 years, uh, the, the European, European settlers, I would just call them Euro-Americans, they were living side by side with Native Americans. Now, I live in New Mexico now, so I'm very blessed that I have ample opportunity to interact with Native people. But back then, it was like a hundred times more, more uh, likely that you would be encountering native people all around you, you know, and that was, and so that occurred. And often, you know, too often in history, people talk about colonization as if it was a one, uh, just a, a one way event. Um, and the reality is, although a, in the long run, it did turn out that colonization was tremendously destabilizing and tremendously debilitating to Native Americans for a very long time, really up for 200 years, for 150 years leading up to the formation of the Union and the first 50 years of the United States of America being formed, uh, Native populations were relatively stable and they were very much interacting with the uh, colonial settlers on a nation to nation basis. And they were critically important to the founding of the country in so many ways. Because, you know, whenever you have cultural interchange, it's not one way. It's not that the Europeans were all of the enlightenment mentality and they convinced the native people to be that way. Not at all. The native people showed a different kind of way of living to the European settlers. And Ben Franklin famously said, and you'll, you'll have to apologize for the, the choice of his words, but I want to explain that too. But he said, he said that any, any European that has tasted savage life will never go back to our way of living. And that sounds like a completely racial slur, and perhaps it is, but it also is an indication of the word, the way the word savage changed in history. So, uh, you know, um, 200 years ago or 250 years ago, that word really meant only wild and untamed, wild and untamed. And so it wasn't necessarily a, a, a complete racial slur. Um, it was obvious to the Europeans that native people were more comfortable in the wild. They were more, if you look at the very origin of the word wilderness in, in, in European languages, it posits a separation between human and nature. And the wild is something to be f afraid of. But indigenous people don't really think like that. The wild is a place of blessing and wholeness. And that's actually at the core of a difference. In short, yes, there was a very strong cultural interchange. Everything shifted when Ben Franklin, who had been a treater, a, a printer of uh, Native American treaties between the uh, uh, the British government and uh, and the uh, uh, the Native tribes, when Ben Franklin was invited to become the Indian ambassador to uh, uh, the Haudenosaunee, or more commonly known as the Iroquois. 
And he was asked to be that because it was really critically important that the British government establish a military alliance in the French and Indian wars. And that's where everything shifted. Ben Franklin becomes the Indian ambassador uh, to the Iroquois Confederacy. And because of that, he he forms a friendship with Chief Kana Astego, the Onondaga chief. And that friendship alters the whole path of history because it's, 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 it's the Onondaga chief Kana Astego who addresses the colonists on July 4th. It's interesting, it's July 4th, but July 4th, 1744, exactly 32 years before the Declaration of Independence is signed. And he tells the colonists that they should unite like the five fingers of one hand, that they should never fall out with one another, that they should form a strong Confederacy as the Iroquois had. And in fact, the Iroquois Confederacy, by some estimates, was as old as 1132 AD. So it had been in force already for more than 500 years before this event happens. And so Chief Conestego urges the colonists to unite. Ben Franklin is really the, 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 the pivotal player in the, in the whole formation of the nation, really. Um, ben Franklin um, proposes that they form a, a government that's based similarly to the Iroquois government. Um, and the Iroquois government, was they didn't have a written constitution in the way that we think of it. Their history was kept on wampum belts. Um, but they did, they did have a, uh, something known as the Great Law of Peace, which, which is the way that their government was run. Uh, and their government had a lot of similarities to what later became the United States of America. These things are not, they're not coincidental. Um, in, it, when the United States actually is formed, after they formed the Continental Congress, uh, ben Franklin is the principal author of the Articles of Confederation, which are really closely aligned with the Iroquois Great Law of Peace. Chief Conestego handed Ben Franklin a single arrow in 1744 in front of all the, all the, all the colonies, uh, the representatives of the colonies. And before Ben Franklin could do anything with that arrow, he took it back and he broke it over his knee. And then he reached behind him and got a sheaf of arrows. I don't know if it was 13 arrows, but it was a sheaf of arrows. And he did the same thing. He went to break it over his knee, but it did not break. And the meaning was plain to all. It was clearly that there was strength in numbers, strength in numbers. And so uh, Ben Franklin never forgot this. And when it came time to design the Great Seal of the United States, he proposed that in the left talon of the eagle, the eagle would hold a sheaf of 13 arrows. And Your book, Original Politics, which I think is, a, is a, a, an important and, and good read for, for anyone. Uh, let me, if you will, read from a, a summary, if you will, a brief. Original Politics, Making America Sacred Again. To recreate a whole and sacred America, it is important to piece together the forgotten fragments of history that are currently keeping the country divided. Just as a traditional Native American potter begins a new pot with shards of old pots to honor the ancestors and bring the energies of the past into the present, original politics reassembles the nation as a whole out of the seemingly disparate shards from our origins. Hmm. The most significant forgotten piece is the profound effect Native America had on the founding values of this nation. The reason why I, I wrote that synopsis of the book is because I was profoundly influenced by uh, some potters, Dolores Lewis Garcia and Emma Lewis Mitchell, who are the daughters of the great potter from Akoma, uh, Lucy Lewis. They're the ones that taught me that, you know, whenever they make a new pot, they begin with the shards of an old pot. 
So really what they're doing is they're bringing the, they're bringing together the old and the new in a timeless creation of original beauty. And that's really what, uh, the nation of the United States needs to do now. Our sacred purpose, as I see it anyway, inspired by Native America, was unity in diversity. Unity in diversity. The acceptance of different points of views, the acceptance of the integrity of the difference. Sometimes I like to use an example of sacred mayonnaise, if you will. You know, mayonnaise, mayonnaise is an emulsion. It's an emulsion. So everybody knows that oil and water can't mix, we say. But in fact, in, in certain emulsions, oil and water are held in a balance so that the integrity, the difference is respected. The same thing has to apply for uh, women and men, for Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives. Native Americans and Euro Americans um, and all the other Americans that have come to inhabit this land as we embraced our sacred purpose of unity and diversity increasingly over time. I will give the Founding Fathers a lot of credit for the phrase and the preamble of the United States Constitution, which speaks of, uh, of moving toward a more perfect union. A native worldview and a native way of operating politics would include the natural world because it's obvious to indigenous mind, it, it seems to me, you know, that we are radically interconnected with all there is. As long as we don't realize it, we're going to keep keep enhancing polarization. We're going to keep thinking and dehumanizing and demonizing the other side that thinks a little bit differently when the reality is, is quite different. It's that we're all aspects of the whole. We're all contributing to the whole. And, and a conservative view is really necessary for a liberal view, uh, just as necessary as a liberal view, because there's two energies in nature, you know, one to progress, and want to conserve. <laughs> you need them both. You need them both to be uh, have a holistic view, and they need to be in, in relative balance so that they're so that each one keeps the other one in check. Uh, it's super important to have wisdom leading. A lot of Native American tribes had a balance between wisdom and action that often had the women's council were the wisdom council and the men's council were the were the uh were the, the 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 ones that enacted action in the world well that to me seems like is a really good balance you know it's a really good balance because uh you need wisdom to come first and then you need action in the world. We really need to um, see the wisdom of women and then, and men need to be able to operate from that wise perspective. It has a lot to do with reuniting feminine wisdom with masculine wisdom um, and uh, recognizing that that holistic uh, approach is what we need to bring.